You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Great to be with you again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, always free and available on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. And thanks for making us your first listen. Today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use our code Locked On College for $20 off your first purchase. Back for another Locked On Texas Tech special edition with the only Chris Level. I'm Casey Cowan. And great today to be joined by Elvis Gallegos, who covers the Horn Frogs of Texas Christian. I hear from a similar vantage point to our own big handsome Chris Level. And so we're going to get a frog breakdown here today. Looking forward to it. Elvis, thanks for the time today. Absolutely. Casey, thanks you for having me. Chris, thanks for having me. Excited to be on. And yeah, for, for a guy like Chris that runs the sidelines with me, anytime he calls or texts ass, I'm right there. He knows that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately, you, you have to deal with, uh, you know, Brian Estridge. I have to deal yes. with Brian, Brian Jensen. We have to deal with a couple of Brian's. No, we're, we're fortunate to work with quality folks up in the, up, up right. in the booth. Yeah, I bet uh, I bet you're ready for for football like we are. Take us through the just the big picture dynamic of a, of an interesting, you know, off season like like Texas Tech and most programs. So much roster change and all that, but we'll get into the nuts and bolts here in a minute. But just kind of big picture glance at yeah. the season coming up. For sure, yeah, man. I mean, I, obviously, you look at uh, since Son- when Sonny Dykes arrived. I mean, in 22 and the run that they had, just an incredible run to get to the national championship and high expectations, you know, we're there for 23 and we just fell flat on our face. I mean, flat out, just uh, a lot of things didn't go our way. It was just that kind of year, but you know, talent's been there. I think this coaching staff has recruited well, obviously Sonny has made some big adjustments with the new defensive coordinator. You got to give him a ton of credit there because Joe was a good friend, good friends of his. And then, I mean, that's hard to do after just his second year, but it was a move that needed to be made. So they brought some, uh, new coaching staff in. Uh, obviously, I think that they hit the portal hard and you look at spring ball, but I'll be honest with you guys, it, it's so different nowadays. Spring ball is so hard to predict. Gosh, going into 22, I thought, uh, I don't, I didn't know if we had a pretty good team going into 22 and they make it to the national championship. Last year, I thought spring ball was pretty good and we don't go to a bowl game. So this year is so hard to, to, to look at spring ball and think what you got. But I do like the guys that they went after in the portal, and that was something that was going to be a big focus for this coaching staff. I think they will probably even admit that they missed on some guys uh, that they went for in the portal before, and so they probably refocused and shifted on some things that they valued, maybe playing a lot of football, and they brought in some guys that look really good. And So, yeah, the talk I think is going to be uh, high expectations as they should be, just like they are probably in Lubbock, especially when the big dogs like Texas and Oklahoma, they get all the best recruits or out of the picture, it's wide open. So I, I hope it's a, there's a big buzz around town and hopefully the frogs can deliver. I want to get to some of the nuts and bolts, as Chris said, about some of the newcomers in the trenches on the O-line. I want to swing back uh, to the D.C. as well, but kind of more, I guess, an abstract question. Uh, I'm curious about how you go about impacting one thing that was really good for the Horn Frogs a couple of years ago and then not so much to their advantage last year, and that's the turnover margin. I mean, how can you really quantify – going out and finding ball hawks or playmakers when it's so lopsided not long ago, you wind up in the national championship game. And then it goes the other way, a wild swing. And I know they wanted to swing uh, back the other way, I'm sure. Well, okay, so you're talking to a former safety, and and I and I value those guys in the back end. I really do. Uh, but, man, I think it started up front. I really do. I, I just think that we couldn't apply any pressure. And I don't care – you know, if you can't who, – who's in coverage there, it's going to be hard to hold up. And those guys were held accountable too. But I think up front, we, we ran a lot of three-man front. We sat in a lot of base. We didn't pressure. We didn't come from different angles, and guys knew what to expect. They protected well. And before you know it, we got shredded. And so when you give that much time, you get you can't get the quarterback off his spot. You can't create turnovers. I do believe in that turnovers start up front, and it's just applying pressure. And I think that this coaching staff – with the new hire and the scheme that we're hearing and the way that they're going to try to approach it. You might even see a little bit of old school TCU in a way because it may be more of a 4-2-5 and get out of that three-man front. So, yeah, it just – I think it all starts up front and you got to really win at the trenches. 
I want, I, you know, we've got all kinds of football to talk, but I'm just going to cut to the chase on some of this stuff. Um, Please do. What, what, is, you know, what is your opinion on Gary Patterson working for Baylor? Oh, as a, as, I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm that fascinates Man. me. I grew up in Fort Worth. Uh, <laughs> I, I, have, I have a ton of friends that went to TCU and that played there and all, all that stuff. And, you know, Kendall Browse is working in Fort Worth. That, that whole dynamic just kind of almost makes my head explode. But maybe it's just become somewhat normal now but i mean just your your honest uh, uh opinion there oh man you had to ask me that. <laughs> uh, not even 10 well, minutes in man no, early hey, too. It. it's, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating it's fascinating to me yeah, it is fascinating um i mean the two schools that that we were just hoping he didn't go to he had to go to texas and baylor <laughs> And I mean, come on, look, a lot of folks are frustrated with that. I mean, it's real. Yeah. Let's be real about that. I mean, those were two heated rivalries and and those are two schools that we went after hard. Um, but I know Coach P on a personal level, obviously, he meant a lot to me and 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 what he did for me. And so I don't hold it against him. It's just the way it is. The guy's a the ball coach. He's gonna coach. And um I'd like to think that those were probably the best places he could have landed. So he chose the best opportunity. But man, I talked to a lot of the former players. And we spent a lot of time talking about it. Why those two schools, especially now? And so I'm just like, man, I'd rather not even go there. But uh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to put I you on the spot, but it, it's no. it, because when Kendall Bryles was hired by Sonny yeah. Yeah. last year, there was a lot of the TCU fan base was like, seriously, like we, this is what we're doing. And anyway, the, the whole, and his offense was pretty good last year. I think they averaged over 30 points a game, but I'm just kind of, the, the dynamic is just, it's wild to me. It's the times that we're living in, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. no kidding. Especially the two schools, Baylor and TCU, mm -hmm. and, and, and especially the offense and the defensive side of robberies that we're going. But I would love Kendall. I really do. I mean, I, and I, Kendall and I go back to, we played against each other in high school. And so just had a great career. He's a bright mind. I, I really do. I uh, think it was hard for him to come to make this move because of just, boy, the way TCU fans just lashed out about it. I mean, that, yeah, that's real. They were really frustrated about it. And I'm sure we'll talk about that. But I actually thought Kendall, uh, being under Sonny, I, I hope Sonny really spent a lot of time with him in this offseason to be able to help some of that gaps that I saw. But, boy, he's a bright mind, man. He knows, he knows football well. He has a great relationship with the guys. I'm really pulling for him. You know, you're talking about two teams you didn't want Patterson to go to, and I've always had a lot of respect for him as a football coach, obviously. And I can think of about, I guess, nine and then 13 and now 15 or however many other teams are in the Big 12 Conference. I didn't want him to go to either. Just get out of the league already, man. But he's uh, <laughs> he's hanging around. That dude has been uh, one of those that just, like so many other of the great ones, ran a consistent standard uh, for so long. So we're sharing some pain there. It's just a little more localized uh, maybe for you. But I am curious yeah. to ask you, you talk about, or Chris mentions uh, what the offense was able to do from a points perspective last year, and we're on the subject of Kendall Bryles. Probably some similar conversations in Fort Worth, what we're having in Lubbock. As you look, look at the offensive line, you're thinking new face, new face, new face. Yeah. So yeah. what's the conversation like around that group? And how far do they have to go to be really where you think uh, can get back to competing for something interesting in the Big 12 Conference? Well, I mean, look, I think what we found out about 22 is we had some really good players. I mean, it's some really good guys that are playing on Sundays and got opportunities to play at the next level. But last year, uh, there's no doubt, uh, up front, we weren't we weren't very good. We just were not good. And, and there's a combination of things. When you think about personnel up front – that's the biggest change. You could see four transfers, four different starters that come in and play, and it's much needed, uh, especially those guys up front that are coming in from programs like, like like Law Tech and San Diego State that played a ton of football. The Brockermeyer kids projected to start uh, at center. They transferred in from Alabama. He probably, out of those transfers, probably has played the least, but obviously coming from Alabama, big-time kid, a local kid. Highly recruited, really smart kid. Uh, I think that's going to be a big change. They'll be a lot more athletic. But when you make changes like that, the biggest concern is going to be chemistry. Like, man, how fast are these guys going to gel? You know, is that something that can hold up? I do think they have good depth. There's a few guys. Colton Deary is one of them comes to mind. Ben Taylor Whitfield, guy that got a ton of uh, playing time last year. That'll be six or seven deep. That's really good. That's needed because in, I think even last year, if guys weren't 100% or if one guy went down, it just almost felt like it was collapsing on him. So I think that's the biggest change. I will say 
they've got to spend – the biggest areas for me when I look at last year that they've got to fix, and you can even go back to 22, and you guys may have seen some of this too, it's, it's how you are in the red zone. The Frogs move the ball. They were just awful in the red zone. I mean, they really were. And I think – Quarterback run game, in my opinion, is the hardest thing to defend in the run in the red zone. You look at Max Duggan, my gosh. I mean, you look at uh, what's his, the, the kid that was at OU, Gabriel Dillon. I mean, he's a guy you'd get in the red zone and you do QB runs, QB powers, you're punching in for six. And that's the difference. They couldn't do that. They didn't have any of that. And a lot of times they're worried about Chandler getting hurt or Hoover. What are we going to do to him? I think the deep ball was an issue. Uh, Hoover at times, and I, I, I even hold the coaches, uh, this was on them too. I think at times they weren't best at managing play calls. And this is an area where I hope Kendall to, is going to take a big step forward. You can even look at that Lubbock game, uh, uh, the Tech game we played in Lubbock. I think the Frogs had a lead, and they come out a few plays later, and they're slinging it when we aren't – that's not how we were built, to throw it around the yard. And then we throw a pick, and it changes the game. Tech gets the lead, and, and it just – it was over after that. So just little things that they didn't really do to help themselves out. I thought they were too pass heavy, especially with the running back like Bailey, who I thought was pretty solid last year. So, yeah, man, a, a lot of things that will need to change up front has got to start because I think this group and the skill positions is going to be really talented again. You start talking offensive line, and you mentioned Tommy Brockemeyer. It makes me feel old because I went to high school with his dad, Blake, there in Fort Worth, uh, yeah, Fort yeah. Worth Arling Arlington Heights. Yeah, um, good player. Josh Hoover. You talk about him there. We we had similar issues at, in Lubbock and at Texas Tech with keeping your quarterback healthy and just kind of maybe dinged up and not afraid to run him and all that. Take me through. Is it Josh Hoover's job? Because there was somebody else brought in, but it feels like it is Josh Hoover's job. He's got some experience. I mean, is he in yeah. fact the guy? First, today's episode brought to you by Game Time. Never sweat buying tickets to your favorite events again with Game Time. It's always a breeze using the Game Time app where you're going to find the best last minute deals. And I love being able to scout out a view from any seat before pulling the trigger. And of course, it's always at the lowest price, guaranteed. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it begins, which means you can finish off that last beer at the tailgate at your own pace because Game Time is the place to find last minute seats to any event. They give you the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets, but not just fast and easy. Also secure and simple to use. So right now, download the Game Time app and create an account and use the promo code Locked on college for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem our promo code locked on college for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today for last minute tickets at the lowest price. Guaranteed. Take me through. Is it Josh Hoover's job? Because there was somebody else brought in, but it feels like it is Josh Hoover's job. He's got some experience. I mean, is he, in yeah. fact, the guy? He's the guy, but you know how that is nowadays. Yeah. I mean, uh, number one, he's got to stay healthy. And I think Coach Dykes likes competition. He's going to push these guys. I mean, you look at the the big-time recruit they brought in in Haas Haney out of Alito High School. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I mean, that kid is an elite athlete. Let me tell you, I played with his dad, know his mom there at school at TCU at the same time I was, uh, and I love the kid. They're going to have to get him on the field. And I think Coach Dykes has talked about that. We've got to use his skill set. Super fast, uh, really good, smart football player. But I think he, uh, it is Hoover's job. Uh, Ken Seals is better than they thought. The kid out of Vanderbilt that transferred in, a local kid out of Weatherford. Uh, there'll be some depth there, but it's Hoover's job. And, and let me tell you, Hoover's a guy that uh, he looks better physically. Uh, I think he – He's always thrown a really good deep ball. Even coming out of high school, he was just a guy with good timing, good rhythm, just very catchable ball. But the one thing that I think Hoover did really well that um, I think goes overlooked from last year is look at Savion Williams' number. Savion is a is a, an elite receiver that we've got. Hopefully he builds off of the second half. He struggled in the first half, but you look at his numbers the second half of the year, he's a 6'5 guy that all the scouts are coming in asking about him. Uh, Hoover found his alpha and his dude. I think a quarterback has to have a number one receiver. If you, 
I know it looks good when you have at 9, 10, 11 guys that catch a ball and they all have solid numbers. I don't think that's the way to go. You've got to have a number one guy that you can count on. you got to feed the horse as much as you can. The other guys will get theirs. And we didn't have that early on. And all of a sudden, Hoover comes on and he starts, I mean, at times almost forcing it. And that's okay. But Savion began to grow and become the player that we knew he could be. Because it was always like, man, where's this guy? It's it's going to come out. When's it going to come out? And I give Hoover a lot of credit for that. Like, I mean, he was locked into his guy. He really pushed him, and they really gelled. So I think Hoover's going to be the guy. He's obviously uh, missed spring ball, had surgery. They're saying he's really healthy. He didn't even realize how much pain he was in towards the year. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think he's, he's going to be the guy going in as number one. Uh, sticking in the backfield, we've already mentioned the name, Imani Bailey, uh, impactful running back. And uh, I'm curious, as far as filling those shoes is concerned, um, anticipating, you know, an individual that could emerge, is it going to be yeah. a, by a committee type thing? What's that Watch like? Out. Yeah, man, I, for sure. I, you know, I was a little disappointed to hear when uh, when he was leaving early. Um, really liked c- covering him. Um, but Cam Cook has got a chance to be special. Uh, I mean, this kid out of uh, Round Rock, Stony Point, I believe it is, and and he's really good. The coaches are really high on him. I think it's it's his job. You got some depth there with Trey Sanders, Trent Battle. Got a lot of football under them, but but Cam's a guy. He's just physically different. He's not going to be your top end speed guy that's going to run away from everybody. But gosh, he just seems like he's got a lot of tools. We saw it last year. He got a little banged up, so you didn't see him as much. But, I mean, I, I think you asked the coaches, and they're really excited to, to see he may be the surprise of this team. You, you, you talk about the, the switch at D.C. And, and Joe Gillespie, and how did that get so – I mean, he, going to the title game and winning a CFP game and all that, his defense had a lot to do with that. How did it go from that to, like, he's shown the door so quickly, especially when you consider the, the, the relationship with – was Sonny, and then how did they land on Andy Avalos? Gosh, yeah, I wish I had the, those answers of understanding how quickly it just unraveled. I mean, I think number one is you got to look at we had some really good players. I mean, you lose the Jim Thorpe winner uh, at, at THT, a, a cornerback. D. Winters was a, just a great linebacker, just an athletic. So, so you lost some guys on that defense that are really good. But it's not all on Joe Gillespie, too. Guys didn't take the next step forward. And I'm talking about some of the guys from this past year. I mean, I, I think Bud Clark was a guy that most thought would really come in and, and be an elite defensive back, elite safety for us. And he's got a lot of really good skill sets. But I don't feel like Bud really took the next step forward. Uh, again, we didn't apply much pressure up front. Um, and so when you lose guys up front, and I think there were some guys that were pretty good there that we underestimated that we had, when you have a three-man front, you better be really good. You can't just be good. And I know Dominic Williams had a big year as a freshman. I mean, he's no longer here. But if you're going to have three-man front, you better be really good. And I think now going to the four-man, we realized we needed something up front. I think that's the biggest change that you're going to see and how they landed on it too. I think uh, – I think that was really hard. It took Coach Dykes a while, obviously, to to make the move. And you'd kind of heard that, that he'd been wrestling with, this, with making that decision. And I think he wanted to see what changes would Gillespie would make moving forward. And maybe he didn't get the answer he wanted, or maybe there was nothing. Because I think where Coach Gillespie struggled is sometimes those second half adjustments. I mean, you you, you got to have one plan, and then you got to adjust to what teams do to you in the second half. And we just didn't do that. So the goal now, I think, with this four two five, obviously you look at Avalos and his playing days and his as a DC at Oregon and head coach at Boise State. Uh, I mean, that's a great resume right there. And he's a guy that's going to bring a, a lot of pressure. I think he's a more of an aggressive. Blitz you come from different angles. He's going to leave corners on an island. So that's going to be a key position. Avery Helm is a guy that people talk a lot about as a corner. But, gosh, he's got to take a step forward. I think we were a little disappointed in him, the, the transfer kid out of Florida. And uh, he just didn't play the ball well in the air. I think I think what he lacks is a little bit of ball skills. But he's athletically there. So guys have got to step up. Yeah, we'll have a different scheme. It'll be more of a 4-2-5. You got two really good linebackers, Namdi. Obiezor is, is an elite player. He'll probably be the, the best defensive player. He's the type of guy to put his hand on the ground and come after the quarterback, but he plays linebacker so good, they're going to leave him there. He was a kid that actually came to campus as a safety. So, I mean, that tells you a little bit about his athleticism, the way his body has grown. 
Uh, and so he, he will be a guy that's going to have to lead the charge for this defense, uh, you know, if they're going to really make any noise in the Big 12. Uh, I want to pivot a little bit toward the schedule you got before you. Um, interesting start to the non-conference, Palo Alto and Stanford. Uh, you got SMU in the mix as well outside of the Big 12. And then something Chris and I have talked a lot about is the conversation now approaching a conference schedule really involving not only who you're getting, but also who you're missing. Uh, so how did you feel about some of the breaks within the league uh, for the Frogs? And what do you make of the conference schedule? And uh, I'd like maybe a thought or two on the future of uh, the series with SMU as well from your viewpoint um, yeah. in the battle for uh, the skillet. You know, one of my favorite trips, Chris, you may agree with this, is, is going to Morgantown. I love I love it. Um, and so not playing West Virginia, I was like, oh, man, you know, I kind of knew that was going to happen. But a little bummed out about that. But I, I really, Casey, I like the schedule. I like the way it plays out. I mean, you look at – I think we have two Friday games. So we kick off uh, at Stanford on a Friday and, you kick, and then we play Houston at home on a Friday night. I think sometimes those Friday nights add a little extra juice uh, because sometimes you got to find a way to get up for some of these games. And those two sometimes are a concern. Uh, you know, Houston, I hope there's something there as far as a robbery concern because of the location. I like that. Uh, I hate going to Lawrence, but I believe that game's in Arrowhead at Arrowhead Stadium against Kansas. We don't play well in Lawrence. We just don't. I mean, it just – for whatever reason – and so the fact that we're not – we're playing that at Arrowhead, that's key. I love the fact that we've, we've got uh, Tech and Oklahoma State at home because, I mean, gosh, uh, Stillwater and Lubbock, just brutal. I mean, I remember when I played there, I don't, I don't know if we want to bring that up, but that was brutal back in 04. It's just not a good place to play. So you begin to add – look, everybody's – it's going to be tough for everybody, but I really like the schedule. Give me, you know, if we have to go on the road to Baylor, that's okay. I know Utah is going to be tough. I've, I've played up there before. That's a really, really great place. Um, BYU is a tough place, but we don't play them. So all of a sudden you look at the schedule, you're like, man, I really like it. I think it plays out really well. That October stretch, early November, we're going to know a lot about this football team. Um, and I'm excited to have UCF at home. I think those guys got a chance to be – a really, really good year after year team that can recruit, uh, maybe be the best team that recruits in the Big 12 because of the talent in Florida. Um, so, yeah, I, I will say that the SMU one, it, boy, it, I've got a lot of thoughts. I don't know how much time you got about this. Uh, <laughs> plenty, uh, plenty. I, I would love to play these guys every year. Man, if you could just understand the smack talk that goes in day in, day out with the people that I run into that, that, that are from SMU or the Dallas Fort Worth rivalry. And, and I mean, it's just, it needs to be played every year, it, but I get it too. I mean, I, I I'm, I'm not going to lie. There was a point where we were playing SMU. I, I was hoping that that game was on Friday night. I felt like they always brought a little bit more juice to the table than we did. Sometimes you're looking ahead to conference play that you forget to play that game. And I think if mm -hmm. I'm not mistaken, that one is sandwiched between Kansas and UCF, so that's not ideal, but but that's okay uh, because I think because it was sunny coming over, I think a little bit of the heated rivalries, those guys getting in the ACC, I mean, I, I think it's going to add a lot more juice that we needed because I felt like when, when Sonny was over there, they just brought a little bit more than we did, and uh, I was frustrated with that, but I hate that we're not going to be playing it every year because, honestly, I wish that was the game to kick off the season every year. That's how I would play it. That needs to be played, uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it kind of plays out. Yeah, need more regional uh, rivalries and games, not less. I, I don't disagree with you there. Um, the, the portal can giveth and it can taketh away. The, the, one of the last things I have for you is one of the storylines was you, you guys, I, I remember when Jalen Polk left Texas Tech and he was so good and going to be so good. He ends up going to University of Washington – Washington was phenomenal. He's playing in the title game last year and all these things. And I'm thinking, oh, it, it is the D tackle that you guys lose to Oklahoma. Yeah. How bad does that hurt? Because I, I just some some guys, they leave and it's like, hey, they're not getting to play or they're yeah. shown the door, whatever. I'm guessing that that was one that, OK, did, didn't want to lose uh, and all that. But you take me through that dynamic because that was a, a fairly highly publicized transfer. For sure. I mean. There's no doubt that's going to hurt. I mean, I, I think you'd, you'd prefer to have the, the kid. He was really good. Um, you know, I, I just 
my understanding from what I've heard is, look, they outside of that kid, they kept everybody they wanted to keep. Um, okay. And and they, I think they, they went after him. Does it hurt? Yeah, I don't think it's that big. Uh, I think they like the guys that they have up front. Okay. Um, the Devin Deal kid that transferred him from Tulane, he's going to be really good. They're really excited about that. Maybe a scheme change. But, yeah, man, like – and I'm with you on that. The, the transfer portal, uh, I would have loved to have seen him stay because I'm trying to think. I just drew a blank. Uh, Zach Evans, that's the name that comes to mind. Look at Zach Evans a few years ago. He crushed it in 21 for TC. Now, we weren't very good in 2021, but he ends up transferring to Ole Miss and and struggles, got banged up, hardly got on the field, and, and, and Frogs go on to get to the national championship 2022. Now, obviously, that opened the door for Kendra Miller. That was big time. But, man, making the move is not always best. And I get that there's a lot of money at stake for these guys and an opportunity. But, man, it's just like if you're happy and they really want you there, you know, the best thing to do is to stay. But that's hard to tell folks because of the world that we live in today. I would have loved to, for Dom to have stayed. But, gosh, if he's got a better opportunity, if he thinks that's the best fit for him, that'd be great. Uh, but I feel like from the inside what I've heard is they, they wanted him. But, hey, it's okay if, if he's gone. I think we got enough pieces here. Uh, one more before we turn you loose, uh, Elvis, and appreciate your time again. But I, I'm curious, a national championship game appearance obviously buys a lot of slack on the line for uh, any head coach, but such a wild swing to not being where you wanted to be last year. Uh, how would you describe just the temperature of the fan base, administration, supporters, um, and all the like? Where are we at after national final and then five and seven? Yeah, uh, probably pretty anxious to see what, what's going to be rolled out this year um, because, look, there's a lot of folks that for a long time, Coach P built a lot of relationships. He built this program and he built it a certain way and, and they just tied and they're just connected and they're super loyal to him and what was built. But Coach Dykes is just – is he's a great guy. I really like Coach Dykes. I'm rooting for him. I think all of a sudden after that first year, a lot of guys come around. I've seen more and more uh, former players be on campus around. They may even do some more creative stuff. This year, from my understanding, for where former guys can come and talk to the players, more stuff like that. But I think it's almost like the dice are still just bouncing on the table to see what's gonna, what's going to land. It's like this anticipation and a little anxious of like, what do we have? We went from <laughs> – uh, a national title run to five and seven, and it was it was an ugly five and seven, fellas. It wasn't it wasn't any good. And but I will say this: uh, you, you talk to people, and they say we're a few guys away. We got great recruiting class coming up. You look at twenty twenty five. I know we just lost a quarterback kid, but uh, kind of like Tech too, right? Like you guys are putting together great recruiting classes. You got all the tools with Texas and OU. Who's going to jump up and step up? And I think our fan base feels like we can be one of those top teams that can bring in great players, have solid transfer classes, and compete year in and year out for a conference championship. But right now it feels like the dice are just still dancing on the table. Yeah, and fans probably anxious for some consistency. If I'm not mistaken, I thought I saw six consecutive seasons – of alternating winning or losing records. One of those, of course, including, again, the national title game. So uh, that's going to leave you wanting more, if nothing else. That I mean, all the time looking. <laughs> Especially those off seasons, right? Gosh, I remember the one year we didn't make a bowl game. It was the worst off season of my life. So I, I hope these <laughs> players are like, man, come on. Let's get consistent. Let's stay up top. Because I do believe yeah. if we'd have had a good year last year, fellas, we might have grabbed a hold of just kind of the recruiting and, and set ourselves as being a really one of the top teams to continue recruiting, but we just couldn't follow up with it. Man, appreciate the insight. Great stuff there. That that's a bucket full. And there's still a few minutes left if we need to revisit anything from your trip to Lubbock. I think you said it was brutal. I don't know oh, if you gosh. got time, but we've got plenty of time. He's talking about 2004. Uh, <laughs> but we don't yeah, have to. Yeah. So that was, you know, it was great too, is because uh, Coach Cumby was was obviously the OC at, at TCU for a long time. Oh, yeah. Sonny was the quarterback there. We he played, was responsible. Was, That's right. We, we went back and forth a little bit. I, I did, I, I did kind of pick him off once, but he got the last lap. When I kind of <laughs> so I was like, yeah, that, that was not a good second half. 20, 21 to nothing uh, at one point, and then it was, it was. Like, yeah, seven. I, well, I yes. think it was twenty eight to seven at half. And um, and it ended up uh, again. Y'all put seventy on us, but I will say, uh, boy, it was nice to back, having Tech come to Fort Worth two years later with Graham Harrell and 
in, in that oh. group. And, but we heard about it for two years. I mean, <laughs> Coach P didn't let us. I mean, we got 70 hung on us. And and so Cumby, when he was at TCU, that was always – he always had the last laugh. But, yeah, that was not the I, best experience. I hate it. I think your mic dropped out when you were referencing that second game. <laughs> there was some static coming over the air. I'm not sure. Uh, Elvis, appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks, fellas. See y'all. Uh, you bet. He's Elvis Gallegos, and we are Chris Level and Casey Cowan. Thanks for being out there. Subscribe on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts so you never miss an episode. And we hope to see you back for the next round on Locked On Texas Tech.